Yaakov is going to speak about uh, something that's very important and actually he just wrote a working paper for us. This is off the, the hot off the presses. The title of the paper is Memic, The Memics and the Viral Spread of Anti-Semitism Through Coded Images and Political Cartoons. Yaakov has been a, a, a uh, artist in residence with Isa. He's known as Dry Bones, the cartoonist. Uh, he's been with the Jerusalem Post for decades and with um, other newspapers literally throughout the world. He's a member of the National Cartoonist Society, a writer of award-winning Dry Bones blog, which started in 2005. He was educated and a graduate of Queens College, and he had an art degree from there. He's published uh, sort of political and social commentaries, have been quoted and uh, written in Forbes, the New York Times, the London Sunday, London Sunday Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Guardian, Time Magazine, and he's been on CBS, CNN, and other uh, international news media. He began drawing, drawing dry blowns uh, in 1971, and became well known for analyzing and satirizing uh, Jewish issues and the Jewish condition and later Israeli politics and international relations. Um, and he was actually with the Jerusalem Post now for 35 years and he's currently featured in over 40 newspapers just in North America. So, Yako, welcome. And, uh, Thank you. As befitting a cartoonist, I'm usually very flip but, uh, and irreverent, but I have to start by saying that uh, Charles Small and Yissa changed my life, and I'm not going to follow that up with a joke. It's true, and that is when Charles asked me to be a fellow, uh, this was through email. There was some emails back and forth between different people who were upset about an anti-evangelical uh, cartoon, and they sent each other back and forth emails, and then someone said, uh, Dry Bones should do something about it, and that's when I got the email trail, and then soon after that, I got a uh, an email asking if I would be a fellow. Of course, I thought it meant that Charles didn't know I wasn't a girl, because I did not know that he was connected here and like that. And the reason he changed my life is when I was asked to do something about political cartoons and anti-Semitism, I thought I knew the subject backwards and forwards, so I would you know, look up some cartoons, do some research, and uh, and write what I knew. And I did not expect to find something new. And in fact, I discovered something that is radically new, and uh, it changed my perception about a lot of things, and I want to share that with you. <coughs> I must say that last week I met with one of the editors at the Wall Street Journal and I showed him the presentation that I'm about to show you and uh, it looks like the Wall Street Journal wants to do uh, an article about this which they want to get to after the elections. They somehow think the elections are more important. <laughs> okay, so I have this Yale hat, which I put on. See, this is me wearing my Yale hat. <laughs> okay. You'll notice that it's old and shabby. They don't sell these online new. It's like they sell old, st new stuff made to look old. Okay, so memetics and the viral spread of anti-Semitism through coded images and political cartoons. So obviously everybody wants to know what's memetics and did I make that name up or whatever. Uh, there is a branch of behavioral science that examines how things are virally spread. How does an idea get from one person's head to another person's head? So uh, a guy is sitting on the side of the road 
and along comes somebody on a, with a wagon, and the guy on the side of the road looks and says, wow, what do you call that? And he says, it's a wheel. Say, wow, it goes around and like that. What a great idea. And he tells his friends, and before you know it, everybody's making wheels, because the idea of this spreads, and we know about viral marketing. So the, the study of how ideas go from one mind to another, how they are spread, is called mimetics. And a, an idea itself that goes from one mind to another is called a meme. So we're going to deal with mimetics and the viral spread of anti-Semitism. Now I, if it hadn't been for Yale, would call it secret codes, hidden war. But because we're going to be academic, I'm calling it mimetics and the viral spread of anti-Semitism through coded image and political cartoons. And there's a working paper here if you want to grab a copy and study it and get depressed when you get home. <laughs> so in uh, May, Charles asked me to be a uh, fellow. And, uh, and there I am. I'm a cartoonist. See, what that means is that I hide behind my cartoon. Okay, that's what cartoonists do. I've been a political cartoonist for 40 years. And what I do is I try to put my ideas into people's heads. And I do it by having, by having a cartoon and a cartoon character. Which means if you have an argument you don't have an argument with me. You have an argument with him. You have an argument with the cartoon. I like to think of it as a, uh, I'm in the look at the hand profession, right? Don't blame me, that's the cartoon. Go talk about the cartoon, it's not me. Uh, and if you talk to my uh, colleagues, I was just a speaker at the annual uh, awards weekend of the National Cartoonist Society. And if you ask my colleagues uh, what it is that they do, they will tell you that they uh, are trying to educate the public, they're trying to explain to the public uh, what's really going on. But the truth is that what we do is we try to put our ideas into other people's heads which is basically mimetics. So let's take a look at a cartoon. Here's a cartoon uh, about Richard Nixon, cartoon done by Herblock, a very well-known, famous cartoonist, top profession. What cartoons use is metaphor, caricature, and fabrication. And we see this cartoon. Here comes Richard Nixon. And what does this cartoon say? This cartoon is saying that Richard Nixon is a sewer-dwelling slime <laughs> who, as he comes out of the sewer, these dopey people are all welcoming him. Okay? If a, if a uh, columnist had said Richard Nixon is a sewer-dwelling slime, uh, it would not be accepted in good spirit. But for a cartoon, hey, you know. Now, this is a metaphor, right? Herblock is not saying that Richard Nixon actually lives in a sewer. It's a metaphor. And one of the powers and dangers of a metaphor is that it sets the topic, right? So if you're going to argue about this, you're not going to argue about uh, Richard Nixon's policies. You're not going to argue about what was going on. The question is, is Richard New Nixon a sewer-dwelling slime or not? <laughs> so this metaphor sets the discussion. And that's a really interesting power of a cartoon. So if a cartoon says, uh, Jews or the Jewish state targets babies or eats babies, the only discussion that arises is, 
do Jews and the Jewish state target babies and eat babies? So it limits the discussion to what's being presented. Excuse me, there are a couple of seats over here if you guys want to. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've got metaphor, caricature, and fabrication, the, uh, the tools of my trade. It was with the idea of freedom for political cartoons that I value that I came to the idea <coughs> of discussion with a little fear, because I don't want to limit political cartoons. But at the same time, the curious use of cartoons effectively by the Nazis to pass their ideas into people's heads is really scary. I mean, the Nazis were not known for being fun-loving people who told jokes and loved cartoons. But they discovered the incredible power of this, and we can see how these things were so effective. So I came to uh, Yessa thinking that I knew everything and uh, got to work taking a look at anti-Semitism in cartoons. The first thing I discovered, which was interesting, uh, was that the so-called Jewish star did not become applied to Jews until the end of the 18th century. That up until then, images and codes that represented the Jews were Torah scrolls, the uh, um, hands of the Kohanim blessing, uh, the menorah. There were lots of, lots of codes that we use. The six-pointed star, as a matter of fact, is an ancient uh, Middle Eastern uh, symbol, and it's basically made with a compass. If you put the point of your compass here, and you draw a circle, and then you take the compass without changing its size, and you put the point here, and you describe an arc, and then you move the compass to here, and you describe an arc, and you move it here, and you describe an arc. You get a circle, and then you connect the dots, and you get a six-pointed star. And there are lots of what we call Jewish stars in Aseris. Those are, those are burial boxes of bones uh, throughout the Middle East use what we call the Jewish star. It wasn't until the end of the, the 18th century that it was applied to Jews as general. And then the use of it by the Nazis, uh, this symbol of the six-pointed star came to represent Jews, the Jewish religion, Jewish culture, the Jewish race, Jewish ideas, <laughs> And it is an, a, I can't even say it, agglutinative, which means that it sticks on, it glues itself to, some, to all kinds of things. So when you put this in combination with something else, it means that Jews, Jewish religion, Jewish people, Jewish everything uh, do this. So this presentation will be in two parts. The first part, is the secret codes. And the secret codes is what I discovered. The hidden war is what I think it means. Okay, so let's get started with part one, the secret codes. Uh, when I was asked by Yissa to, to do this work, I thought, well, two steps. Number one, you collect the cartoons. Two, you put them into categories. Three, you write all the stuff you know about anti-Semitism and you're out the door. So first I went to find anti-Semitic cartoons, which unfortunately is really easy to do. 
okay, especially today. It used to be that to find anti-Semitic cartoons, you'd have to go and, and look up books or newspapers, but now you just go to Google and you go on Google Images and you uh, write in Jews, and this is what you get, okay? So I end up with a little more than 500 cartoons, and I look at them and say, what now? They're all different. How am I going to deal with this? I mean, there's 550 cartoons. Not that that's what I found. That's when I stopped, right? I had enough of a job. What am I going to do? What's the next step? That's when I discovered this cartoon. This is from 1890. And what we have is a spider conquering the world. And we've got a Jewish star on here. And I looked at that, and it somehow looked familiar. And that's when I discovered that in my pile of 500 and more cartoons, that here is a Nazi cartoon from 41. And then I discover a Soviet cartoon. And now I begin to realize that when we're looking at anti-Semitic cartoons, it's not necessary to know what this says. I don't have to translate that. I don't have to translate that. Right? The images are coming to us through our eyes. Okay? Here's Egypt in the 21st century, and here's our partners for peace. So if you, if you uh, look at all of this, something is going into your brain, okay? What's going into your brain is the concept of Jews as spiders. Now this brain business is very interesting because your eyes are made of brain material. Your eyes are directly connected to your brain. And when you see something, it bypasses all of your filters. When somebody tells you something, you've got a filter. When, when you hear something or read something, you have a filter. But when you see something, there's no filter. That's why when you're at a movie and our heroine is tied up and the monster bad guy has a buzz saw, and he goes, oh, and he's got the sword, he comes at her, you instinctively go, ah, don't want to see this. You don't want it burnt into your mind. And you know emotionally that once you see it, it gets stored in your mind. And because it gets stored in your mind, it means that communication through these images is really effective, really important. Well, having found the Jews as spiders, I then discovered in my pile of images that there's a 1900 woodcut, okay? If I go back, you'll see that what these are are a group of Jews, and they're drinking through straws. They're drinking the blood of a Christian child they have killed. And there's blood dripping, and they're drinking. So here we are in the 21st century, and here we've got all the codes. So, although each cartoonist would maintain that he has come up with a unique metaphor, in fact, this is the Jews as blood drinkers code. So we can follow from 1900 down to 2008 over here, we can see how this code lives in the cartoons. And suddenly I realized, my goodness, there are specific codes that live in the cartoons, in the images. And that's when I decided that somehow Charles had tricked me into having to, having to do some really interesting research work. And what I discovered was that in the 500 and more cartoons, 
I discovered that every one of them, every single one of them, used codes from three families. Dehumanizing codes, stereotyping codes, and moral inversion codes. I became really handicapped because when you're talking about codes, you have to make up words to talk about them. And the minute you're using words, it becomes something different than ah, you see it. Okay? So my definitions and stuff are weaker than the codes themselves. So here we have the dehumanizing family. You've seen these two codes before, right? You saw the blood drinking and the zoomorphic, as in animals, right? So the dehumanizing family of codes is used to express the idea that somehow Jews are not really human. And if they're not really human, but are in fact demonic vermin, right? doesn't mean that Jews are really spiders. It means that this metaphor is now getting into your head. Okay? So the dehumanizing family has two subfamilies, demonizing and zoomorphic. Well, let's look a little more. Still within the dehumanizing family. Now instead, instead of a spider, it's a rat. And instead of blood drinking, it's baby eating. And I discovered, bizarrely, that in the dehumanizing family, in these more than 500 cartoons, there were only 17 specific codes. And these 17 specific codes can be found going back from the Nazis to us today. And one would assume that if, if 50 years from now, the current threat we're facing uh, has been replaced by some bizarre UFO cult trying to take over the world, <coughs> you can be sure that if they're going to use codes, they'll use these same 17 codes. So I said uh, putting word, you know, trying to define with words, the images is sort of difficult. So here's one, devouring mouth. Right? So you don't know what that means until we take a look at these codes, these cartoons in which the codes appear. Here's one from the Nazi period. Here's one, Bibi Netanyahu. And we've got all of these cartoons, each of which the cartoonist would maintain that, well, he's looked at the situation and he's thought about it and he's come up with, with a metaphor as opposed to the fact that what he's doing is his work has now been inhabited by these image codes. So we've got the dehumanizing codes which says that Jews are demonic, baby-killing, satanic, blood-drinking vermin. We've got the, here's the devouring mouth and vermin. These are the dehumanizing codes, okay? The second is the stereotyping codes, right? Jews are ugly, money-groping, powerful, and secretly control the banks, the media, and the world. So we've got everything from Nazis going through down to contemporary, and each of them is the sack of money, and the idea that Jews love money, or that Jews control the media, or that Jews control the world. So these two families, dehumanizing and stereotyping, together they present the idea that Jews are powerful, demonic, evil, ugly controllers of your world, controllers of the banks. They're a powerful enemy. They are to be feared, to be destroyed, and 
you don't, you can't have empathy for them because after all, they're rats, vermin, spiders, blood drinking demons. The problem which was faced, if you remember, I'm looking at this through the concept of mimetics. And mimetics, uh, mimetics says look at beliefs as if they are viral. Okay? Well, what happens when you have bacteria or germs that uh, are having a great time moving from person to person, and then we get some antibiotic, right? And the antibiotic <coughs> makes it unhealthy for these bacteria, for these germs to continue to exist. And therefore, these image codes had a tough time because of the Holocaust. All of a sudden, the world saw piles of bones, saw living skeletons behind barbed wires, and suddenly it was clear that the Jews are not evil, powerful perpetrators, but they are, in fact, powerless victims. And you can't be afraid of powerless victims. And therefore, that belief system, which seeks to portray Jews as dangerous to the rest of mankind, had to evolve a Holocaust-resistant strain. So we'll take a look at this chart. At the bottom, we have the medieval roots blood libels, deicide, superstition, painting, whatever. And that grew into the dehumanizing and stereotyping family. But then the Holocaust happened over here. So to continue to spread, anti-Semitism had to develop a post-Holocaust, Holocaust-resistant strain which I call moral inversion. I apologize for the dopey words, but you get the concept when you see it. So here we have, here we have a picture that you don't have to look at this twice. Because when you saw this photograph, it was burnt into your mind. You recognize that photograph. Everyone in this room, you don't have to look and say, Oh, here's a soldier back here, or here's a woman with a hand, or this, or there's two soldiers, or one soldier. You see this. This is burnt into your mind forever. As long as you live, this is burnt into your mind. So here's a Brazilian cartoon. Okay? Now, you look at this cartoon. He's got the two soldiers, the two soldiers, the whole thing. And you know what? Everyone who sees this cartoon from Brazil, everyone, including you guys, the next time you see this photograph in your head, it's going to say, oh, the kid from Gaza. So what they've done is to do a moral inversion. When I say they, if we look from a mimetic point of view, we can talk as if the bacteria or the germ has a will or a desire to grow or whatever, which is a helpful way to look at it. Okay? So the moral inversion codes don't get up like Ahmadinejad and say, the Holocaust didn't happen. It says, take the victimization and say the Jews did it. Okay? So, one of the moral inversion codes is that Jews are Nazis. Okay? And so suddenly, on my pile of 500 and something cartoons, suddenly I say, whoa, all of these are the Jews as Nazis code, as it has 
survived and grown in the post-Holocaust period. Before the Holocaust, they didn't have to say that Jews are Nazis, because there were no Nazis. Okay? Uh, this cartoon here, with the Nazi soldier and the poor kid, Jewish kid, and the present is the Jewish soldier and the poor kid. This is, I find, particularly <coughs> offensive because this is an Austrian cartoonist working in Austria, the birthplace of Nazism. Okay? This one down here is interesting. We know that Jews were herded into pits, and the lucky, lucky ones were shot and killed, and the un unlucky ones were simply buried alive. So now we have the pit is in the shape of Gaza, and here the stormtrooper with the Nazi helmet, but with the Jewish star on his sleeve, is murdering the people here. So all of these in different ways, but we don't need to know what this says. We've got a soldier with the ubiquitous star of David, and the swastika, and here the star and the swastika, and here the star and the swastika. Okay, so these are Jews as Nazis. I then began to look at the <coughs> continuity of these codes, just over there showing, showing that there are cartoons and images from different periods and that there are these specific codes, uh, I wanted to examine how they have survived, how they have grown, how this particular strain has, has evolved or not evolved. So first, take a look at a Nazi cartoon. And here we have a vulture with the ubiquitous star. Right? Okay. So, Jews as meat-eating, carrion-eating bird. Here we have something from the Soviet period. Once again, we've got this, this bird. And here we have a contemporary cartoon with Condoleezza Rice and, and Olberg and the same bird with the ubiquitous agglutinative symbol of the star, dripping blood and flying along. To our eyes, this is sort of bizarre because we in the West don't think of, of meat-eating birds as being associated with defamation of Jews or excitement. So let's take these two and let's put them away and let's look at how this code fares in other societies. I was giving a speech the other day and I was too dopey to say turn off your phone and one phone rang and it was mine. <laughs> really awful. Okay. So this is contemporary. Now, here is a contemporary cartoon from Turkey. And we have a meat-eating bird with a yarmulke, a and it is eating the babies of a dove. So we've got the meat-eating bird and baby-eating. We find, I find, that these mimetic codes come in clusters. So usually a cartoon that in which the coded images live usually has a number of the codes clustered together. Okay, here we got uh, from Iran. We've got the meat-eating bird who's obviously eating the olive branch. And here we've got the stalk. Okay. The idea that the olive branch is a symbol which comes from the Bible is lost these days, as is the symbol of the dove. Okay, let's go on. 
Here we've got a cartoon from South Africa. Okay? It's got the baby eating code, right? And we have a bottle on the ground here. We don't have to know what this says. We've got the star and the meat eating bird from South Africa. This one's curious here because this is from China. Now the Chinese have this bizarre idea that Jews are smart. I have no idea where they got this from. I myself have not found this to be true. As witness, well, I'm not going to get into politics. Uh, so what do we have here? This is really interesting. Okay, we have a bottle in the shape of Gaza. And our bird wants to drink blood. And the way he's going to drink blood is by dropping enough missiles here so the blood will get up to the top and he will then be able to drink blood. But once again, the silly Chinese think the Jews are so smart that they had to do it that way. Uh, this is a cartoon from Indonesia. Right? Bombing it all. We got the American eagle, the horrified dove, but right behind the eagle is a <coughs> Jewish vulture. Okay. And here's one from Iran. See, these are all Jewish meat eating birds, and once again, kicking out the nest, destroying the babies. So it's the meat-eating bird that kills babies. Okay? To our mind, the meat-eating bird sort of doesn't resonate at all. But another one of the codes that does resonate is the money-grubbing, stingy, uh, Jews lusting after financial gain. So we recognize that in a Nazi cartoon. And once again, we don't need to know what this says. The graphic image that was put into people's minds of the fat, prosperous Jew bulging with money. And then we find practically the same cartoon from the Soviet period, right? It's the same coded image. And then we find the same coded image from the Palestinian Authority. So this is the survival, and not even evolution, just simply the survival of this image code. Uh, that brings us to the United States, okay? This is a cartoon done in the Chicago Tribune by a cartoonist named Locker, I think his name is. Uh, what's interesting is that this cartoonist is a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. This isn't some guy working for some local paper in Alabama. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. And he's a good cartoonist, right? So we can see, here's a picture of Sharon. And we can see, see this wispy hair over here? And he's got the wispy hair over here. You see he's got these sort of puffy eyes with the droopy lids. He's got the puffy eyes, droopy lids. You see he's got this sort of pursed lips. He's got the pursed lips. He's got the little bumpy chin. He's got the little bumpy chin. He's got the tiny nose. He's got the, uh-oh. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> if he was skilled enough to make everything work, why did the nose turn into a big oh, bird beak? Okay. And what's going on? Sharon is saying, on second thought, the pathway to peace is looking a bit brighter because he's going to follow the money while poor Arafat is waiting for the Jews to come across, and the only way they can be brought across is uh, because of their obscene love of money. A cartoon in the 21st century in the Chicago Tribune done by a Pulitzer Prize winning
cartoonist, which raises the interesting question as to whether he is anti-Semitic or whether his infection by this meme has made it automatic. <coughs> Maybe he didn't realize he was being anti-Semitic. It's hard to know. Okay, we've got the baby eating code. We've got medieval. All right. And here. All right. And here, Palestinian Authority. These earlier ones, the uh, basic idea that Jews drain uh, the blood of Christian babies to make matzahs always gets me because when I was a kid in Brooklyn, we had egg matzah, moon matzah, uh, we, had lot, we had whole wheat matzah, but we never had blood matzah. Anyway, here we are going down to the Palestinian Authority, carrying the code of baby eating. This cartoon showing Sharon eating babies is the best cartoon of the year, 2003, voted by the British Political Cartoon Society. <coughs> that means that the professional cartoonists in Great Britain voted, and of all the thousands of cartoons done by British cartoonists in the year 2000, this was selected as the best cartoon, which I find astounding. Okay? And when various groups complained that this was anti-Semitic, the response was, you're just a right-wing supporter of Israel, this is a valid cartoon, and the cartoonist has come up with this wonderful metaphor, which has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. But we now look and understand that this is one of the codes. Another one of the codes is media control. Okay. This is a page in a picture book uh, written by a South Korean professor, and it is a book about the countries of the world, designed to teach South Korean kids about all the countries in the world. And uh, what's interesting is that this page is one of the pages about the United States. Okay, so we learned that in the United States, the newspapers, the books, the TV, and the radio are all Jewish controlled. Although I said that the words don't mean anything, I was so intrigued by this that I went to find out what this says in Korea. And what it says is, it cannot be doubted that in America, all media is controlled by the Jews. There's a very popular children's book in South Korea. Ten million of these in English were distributed. Okay? Well, not okay. But, so here we are, the three families dehumanizing, stereotyping, and the new moral and version codes. And here we've got a chart, and we have dehumanizing and stereotyping, those codes, and then we have the moral and version. And shockingly, all together, in these 500 plus cartoons, I have discovered only these 32 specific images. Three families, 32 images. Uh, I got a phone call from uh, my, the head of my syndicate, 
I'm syndicated internationally by Daryl Cagle, who runs something called politicalcartoons.com. <coughs> and he called me up one day and he said, hey, Yakov, what's new? As Charles knows, I often just respond before engaging brain. So I said, uh, oh, I can't tell you. And then there was a silence and he said, well, I syndicate your cartoons. I want to know what you're doing. So I had these cartoons up on a website where I had it closed because I don't want people to see this. I was preparing for this stuff. So I said, okay. And I went and I opened up the website for Daryl to look at. And I thought that he would be horrified because I'm attacking the freedom of political cartoons. <coughs> and instead, he said, this is wonderful. Can I put this up on our site? And I said, why would you do that? And he said, because we get cartoons from all over the world. And every now and then I look at a cartoon and I say, you know, this is anti-Semitic. So I write to the cartoonist and I say, this is anti-Semitic. And he writes back and says, what are you talking about? Why is it anti-Semitic? And he says, you know, we think of anti-Semitism as being like pornography. You can't define it, but you know it when you see it. He said, what you've done is you've discovered that there is a way to define it. And if I could put this information up on our website, I could tell cartoonists who are submitting cartoons for syndication to say anything dealing with Israel, please look and see that you don't violate our policy of not reproducing these codes. And what's more is I think every syndicate would like to have these guidelines. So that means that somehow I have stumbled onto the idea that there are criteria and guidelines which has come out of this work at YISA, which I think can be very valuable and can make an impact. And using the concept of, of this criteria, I want to go over two particularly interesting uh, events, two incidents. This is one that anybody who's been involved in fighting anti-Semitism in cartoons knows about. So you probably know about this, and this is one you don't know about. So let's take a look. And this is Pat Oliphant. Pat Oliphant is the most widely syndicated cartoonist in the entire world. He appears in the LA Times. There is nobody who appears in more papers than he did. When this cartoon came out in 2009, Camera, uh, Camera's an organization that uh, looks to, uh, to demand accuracy in the media. It's not pushing one side or another, but it seeks to identify accurate and inaccurate. And Cameron said this is anti-Semitic, and he said, no, it's not. It's my expression of my belief about what's going on. But now we can look, and we can <coughs> say, OK, Nazi, as the Jew says Nazis, with a Heil Hitler salute. If it wasn't a Heil Hitler salute, it would be pointed down at her. So we've got the Jews as Nazis. We've got the devouring mouth, okay. and here, well, we just have a woman and a baby. Uh, interesting, I've pointed this out before. Why is this wheel here? The wheel is here to give the star some weight, so you would perceive this as marching along. Right? If that wheel wasn't here, you'd recognize the star and a top bar and a bottom bar. This is a picture of the Israeli flag, and what this cartoon is 
putting into your mind is Jews are Nazi devouring mouths, targeting babes in mothers' arms, and this is all expressed through the state of Israel. Okay? So let's take a look at that mother and child that didn't ring true to you as a specific code. Uh, here is uh, Pieta, the, the mother and child. Here's one from Brazil, mother and child. Here's one from Turkey, mother and child. Here's one <coughs> from Iran, mother and child. And this is Arab because it was distributed by the Arab News Agency and appeared all over the Arab world. Okay. Here's Mexico, and this is practically the same as uh, Oliphant's. Okay. Which means when we look at it, we now recognize this as being one of the standard codes, which I call killing children in their mother's arms. If somebody has a two-word phrase, which I could use instead of this, I would appreciate it. But <laughs> killing babes in arms is all I could come up with. So now let's take a look at this. This is one that you probably don't know about because this happened in Europe. Uh, I have to explain this to you. You see this line here and this line here? This is a frame. This is a big poster. Okay? And the poster is a photograph of someone holding up a cartoon. Okay? These are the hands. This is the cartoon. This is from this year, 2010. Uh, the Israeli embassy in Germany rebuked the public prosecutor's office in Cologne. They said this is uh, anti-Semitic. And the uh, Cologne authority said, what's anti-Semitic about it? You know, it's a, it's, it's a political comment. There's nothing anti-Semitic. Interestingly, uh, the Israelis say it shows a figure with an Israeli flag devouring a Palestinian child. I do not see an Israeli flag here. Uh, this cartoon, which says Gaza in English, was taken from a cartoon which uh, was one of my 500 cartoons for Yisra. So when I thought, when I saw that, I said, wow, isn't that interesting? This is the original of that cartoon. Okay, there it is. And here's the original. All right, so what does this cartoon say? This cartoon says, Jews drink blood. Jews eat babies. Jews spill blood. And over here, America is a fork. That means that the Jews are controlling America. So it's got controlling your government, drinking blood, eating babies, blood spilling. And interestingly, it says this is about the Jews, right? If it was going to be about Israel, it would be like this. Now you look at that, that's talking about Israel. But it's not. It's like that. And the Israelis looked at it and said, oh, it's an Israeli flag. No. If you wanted it to be an Israeli flag, it would look like this. This is not about Israel. It is a libel against all Jews as a threat. So at this point, I thought maybe I had some questions about the secret codes. If not, I'll move on to the even more scary part. I have one question. Uh, there are so many Burmans <coughs> that humans are afraid of or, mm -hmm. or upset about. Are these codes also used against other ethnic hatred cartoons? Fascinating question. Uh, I thought that since Yissa is not just about anti-Semitism, but about all races, I thought it would be really cool to now discuss 
anti-Chinese, uh, anti-Spanish or anti-Muslim or whatever does not exist. What we have here is something bizarrely unique. There is no symbol that means <coughs> Islamic religion, Islamic people, Islamic culture. There's nothing analogous to this, which I find bizarre. If there's, and I'll get to that later. Yes? Just notice that with the exception of maybe the last Master, all that stuff from, from the uh, Nazi period and from before doesn't mention Israel because there was no Israel. As soon as there was an Israel, this was a convenient focus. But, and by extension, there's no other mention of, uh, of the Jew as the vermin of the devouring mouth, except in the context of Israel. Why do you say except? If there is one Jewish state, so that represents, before there was a Jewish state, there was a Jewish conspiracy. There was so it seems like the entire image of, of um, Jew becomes so equals Israel. All the modern ones, there's nothing associated from it. I don't know what relevance that has since 20% of Israelis are non Jews. Right? And a number of the Israeli soldiers who were captured in the Yom Kippur War were Bedouin. I was doing cartoons for the Jerusalem Post at the time, and we had military censorship in Israel. And as soon as the war broke out, the word came out that you could not mention non-Jews in the army. And the reason was because a whole unit of Bedouin Muslims had been captured and they were in Egyptian prison camps frantically not speaking Arabic because it was safer for them to be thought of as Israeli Jews rather than loyal Israeli Muslims or Druze or Christians or whatever. So I just think, I don't want to belabor too much, but I think it's easier to delegitimize Israel than to make it about Steven Spielberg, for example. I think, you know, you're not finding any outrage. Uh, right, but I showed you a cartoon from Cologne, which I put a flag on it, yeah. and you could see the difference. Yeah. And if they wanted to say Israel, they could. Yes? Uh, there's a well-known cartoon showing a Palestinian terrorist with an assault rifle and a child's with carriage, the carriage with the in big front, big. and then the Israeli soldier facing him right. with the carriage behind him. I don't know if you created that cartoon, no. No. but uh, I assume that there's a whole series of cartoons that demonize Iran or Palestinian I've terrorists. I've never seen any. Uh. I've never seen any. I mean, maybe it would be good if we, we developed something to promote hatred of a whole group of people or a whole group of people. But we don't do that, so. There's another question here before I go on. Yes. Uh, just as far as the Pat Oliphant cartoon, which you analyzed, wh why do you think there's no head for the soldiers? Any yeah. significance? I think there's no head on the on the on the Oliphant cartoon because the only head that he could have drawn would have been clearly anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. just like we saw the one of following the money across the road have to have a Jewish hook nose in there. And Oliphant is a really good cartoonist, and he recognized that if he did that, then it would be exposed as anti-Semitism. Like I say, he is a colleague of mine, uh, and I've met him a couple times, and I'm going to be really happy to send him one of the working papers. <laughs> so, Let's get into part two, which is the hidden war. Um, analyzing this stuff, I began to say, well, what does this mean? Where does this lead me? And here we've got the Haggadah, right? The Passover Haggadah. And in it, it says, in every generation, they rise up against us and seek our destruction. That's bizarre. 
you know, here is a book designed for generations and generations of Jews to read, to celebrate their coming out of Egypt, moving from slavery to freedom, the birth of the Jewish nation, and it goes about the, the plagues and crossing the river and all the stuff that happened. Why in the middle of that did they put this sentence in every generation they rise up against us? And it suddenly occurred to me that they recognized something and they couldn't quite figure it out. But one thing they had figured out that in every generation that they rise up against the Jews, there's a different reason. You know, there's a different event that has caused this, and that in effect, this attack has nothing to do with the reason at this point in time. It means it keeps coming in every generation. Okay? So it means when it's September and October, it's time to get your flu vaccine because we're in front of the flu season. And the flu comes around every year. And they were saying, this thing comes around every generation. And suddenly I looked at that and said, golly, through the work at Yissa, I've come to recognize that looking at it mimetically, what we've got is a viral spread. And if the reason now is the way we treat Gaza, the reason 20 years from now is going to be tied to whatever. But they're saying, it's every generation. This is cyclical. And that was suddenly tied in with what my findings were. And what we've got today is this monster that that is being presented to the world right and why why is that happening well let's go back and take a look at memetics if we look at each idea you know cigarettes are bad murder is wrong men are fickle jews are smart beliefs i showed this to someone and said no no it's supposed to be women are fickle <laughs> okay so if we look memetically at these individual ideas, we can look at how ideas come together to form belief systems. This is an examination of democracy. Free press, no cruel or unusual punishment, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, right? And it says here, right to bear arms and no state religion. Well, there are lots of people who believe in democracy who say, no, 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 there's no right to bear arms. And you know, England has the Anglican Church as its. So it means sort of that a belief system can incorporate some means and not others. Right? So there's Christianity, the, the belief system of Christianity would be slightly different for Protestants and slightly different for Roman Catholics and slightly different for Greek or Russian Orthodox, but they would share a lot of beams. And every day we are hit with individual memes and belief systems. Okay, and when we're hit with them, either by people telling us Things like uh, America never landed on the moon, the whole thing was a fabrication, or 911 was pulled off by George Bush, or whatever those beliefs are, we filter them. We say, I don't believe that. Or I do believe that. I'll swallow that. So if we look at the virus we're dealing with, in the 19th century, it was divided by two kinds of means, demonic vermin and stereotyping. And if we look at this as, as a disease, we then see that the virus today has now incorporated 
There's Jews and Nazis there. And Gaza is a concentration camp. Right? So this is the condition of the virus today. So biological viruses infect people, and they cough. Why do people cough when they've got a virus? The coughing spreads the disease. People don't choose to cough. And I would assert that cartoonists who have been affected, the idea pops up in their mind, and it's involuntary. Now, it comes to Christmas time, and a cartoonist is sitting at his paper and says, well, the Palestinians want a steak, and they don't have a steak. What am I going to do? And it's Christmas. Blah, blah, blah. No room at the inn. So I'll show the Palestinians, and the Jews are saying, no room at the inn. Right? Oh, I just thought of a unique. It doesn't mean that the cartoonist is <coughs> a conscious spreader, but may simply be infected. Then we have computer viruses, right? A virus in your computer, all of you have antivirus protection. Well, it's not a biological virus. What, what infects your computer is a self-replicating software program. You can't say, I have an anti-self-replicating software program. Right? Say, I have an antivirus program because it is virally spread because I went to my daughter's house and she's got a computer and she's also got a teenager and the teenager of course is going to websites and downloading stuff and doing all kinds of stuff and I've got my flash drive and I poke it in because I want to print out some stuff and I print out some stuff and I take my flash drive back and then dopo I go and put it into my laptop and the next thing I know I've got a virus in my laptop because the nature of computer virus is to spread from, from one computer to another. And then we've got dangerous cultural viruses which infect our societies. So through the use of these symbols and the spreading of this uh, mimetically viral spread of hatred, we end up with our streets looking like this. Okay? And what is the purpose? Everyone is horrified. Oh my God, look at that. Look what the Jews are doing. Look what the Jewish state is doing. Oh, the poor Gazans, what's happening? Oh, my God. And everyone is focused. And they're looking at this horror. And they're looking at the horror of the powerful, evil enemy. And I like to think of it as if there is a worldwide federation wrestling match going on. And in the center ring, you've got the Jews killed babies. The Jews are targeting babies. The Jew, Jews have made Gaza into a, a concentration camp. And then you've got the Jews up there saying, we don't kill babies. Gaza is not a concentration camp. And everyone in the audience is watching that. And because they're focusing on that, they're mesmerized by that. And if Islamo-fascists had decided if Al-Qaeda and, and Ahmadinejad had decided, who cares about the Jews? Let them win their Nobel Prizes. They're irrelevant. How many of them are in the world? And they were pushing their programs. You would have, I believe, every woman's group demonstrating against them, every gay and lesbian group demonstrating against them, Every professor who is interested in academic freedom would be demonstrating against them. Every atheist, every Buddhist, every Hindu, every newspaper man, every journalist would be demonstrating against them. But they're, but they're not because everybody is focused on this. And everybody is sitting in the audience watching the battle. And their pockets are being picked and they're being taken over. So we can look at the function of anti-Semitic propaganda. A uh, wonderful book written in 1951 called The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements. Uh, Eric Hoffa pointed out that mass movements do not require a god, but they require a devil. They require a malady 
that only they have the answer to. So if we can pass the mean to everyone that these evil Jews are a threat, well, <clears throat> then we're going to look at that, we're going to argue about that, and not recognize the takeover. So I maintain, as a hidden war, that when you see these anti-Semitic codes, what you have to understand is that that's a symptom of the presence of a viral attack against Western civilization. So, you got a kid, and one morning, the kid wakes up, and he's covered with red spots. So you take the kid to your doctor, and you say, my kid is covered with red spots. And the doctor says, no problem. I've got this flesh-colored paint, and I'm going to paint him over, and you won't see the red spots anymore. And you look at the doctor and say, are you an idiot? He's sick. There's something inside him that's causing these spots. Does he have measles? Does he have smallpox? Does he have chickenpox? It's a symptom. And these anti-Semitic codes are a symptom of something. So if society is going to protect itself, society has to look at this through disease control. Here is uh, Louis Pasteur, and uh, what do you do? Society needs to collect samples of the various strains, which I've been doing and presenting in the working paper, examine the means of contagion, and warn the public. Uh, Louis Pasteur had my problem. I mean, he comes around and says, you're getting sick because there's this stuff that's so teeny, 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 you can't see it. But if I take blood from a woman who milks cows, then I, it's, the thing sounds bizarre. So society, in order to protect itself, is going to have to adapt this approach. But that's not what academia <coughs> has to do. Academia, has, I believe, has two things to study. One is the apparent uniqueness of the phenomenon. How is it that these incitement codes are only linked to Jews? Why, why aren't there incitement codes for all different civilizations and societies? And the second interesting thing that needs to be studied is the metamorphosis of the host movement. What do I mean by this? Every, you know, rabies is a viral infection. When a dog gets virus, gets rabies, it bites people. Bites people and passes the virus on. But not only does the virus cause this behavior, the virus begins to infect the dog itself. The dog becomes unable to swallow and it dies. It kills the host. So if I were to say to you, what was the Nazi program? You say to kill Jews. It was a national, national socialist movement. It had all kinds of ideas of who owns the means of production and all kinds of ideas about society. But in the end, it became about killing Jews. And we can look today at uh, Muslim fanatics and say, as they begin more and more to use these incitement codes, they themselves have become perverted and twisted. So if you're thinking about Islamo-fascists, what are they? They're people who want to kill the Jews and Americans, right? You no longer think of them as people who want to do away with interest on bank loans or following Allah or whatever because the disease that they are handling and trying to spread has infected them. And with that, I leave you with a picture of a kid covered in red spots. Thank you very much. And thank you.
complex ideas and present them very clearly to us. Is there other questions or comments? I have to answer them? I guess. <laughs> Question? Yes. Yeah, it's actually a comment. It seems to me that, uh, and I know all these, um, I study antiseptism, so I've seen this material, and you're absolutely right. Uh, uh oh, is it going to be a book? <laughs> no, it is going to be an end. Okay. <laughs> right? And the end is that uh, it's important for us to see these images and to understand them. And they go back even before uh, <laughs> the yeah. late, not, uh, as you show, some of them go back to the Middle Ages. With, uh, uh, and possibly the, before the Middle Ages. Yes, with the killing of, uh, and in fact, their, uh, uh, Joshua Trachtenberg wrote a book in the 1930s about uh, the demonization of Jews uh, in in uh, ancient med medieval thought. And Mark Twain wrote an essay on yeah. it in eighteen sixty yeah. whatever. So um, so this has a long, as you showed, a long history and very uh, and it's very connected. And I thought, was watching this. I was thinking, do these do these cartoonists simply look at other people's cartoons and copy them? Hmm. And I know it's much more complicated than that. But I would say that for scholars of anti-Semitism, we also have to study the people who are, or the societies that seem to be most immune to the virus, most immune to the disease, because there are societies where uh, where anti-Semitism does not, in fact, infect uh, large numbers of the population. And there are also societies which are infected, like Nazi Germany, where you can still see people who dissent, uh, who refuse, uh, even at great cost, very few people, I should add, but people who dissent from uh, what has People become, who refuse to be infected. Yeah, yes. People who recognize or, the danger. So I was using your, your uh, imagery, I would say, people who have natural immunity. Okay. Uh, uh, or, or societies that have somehow developed, um, developed values uh, or political systems that make them less likely to become infected. Uh, that that's really important in understanding um, anti-Semitism. By the way, I should add that uh, uh, there is a nice tune for the Hishamda uh, from the Agada, mm -hmm. and we sit there and sing it with a, uh, during our seder. <laughs> sing that with a joyous. So it's always struck me as rather uh, well, incongruous. Yes. Incongruous. The old po I pointed out the meme that Jews are smart that I didn't agree with. Is there another question? Thank you. Or are we done? Yes. I'm, I'm interested in your idea of, of criteria and guidelines for cartoonists. And it, first of all, I'm, I'm wondering if there are any general guidelines that already exist for what cartoonists can and can't do, because they, no. seem, they seem to get away with a lot. No, <coughs> no, and th there are none. And I mentioned this at uh, in a speech I gave. I was one of the ten speakers at uh, this year's NCS convention, and I talked about a whole lot of other things. And when I ended, I mentioned Yissa, and I mentioned the codes and like that, and everybody sort of sat up and said, people ask questions, and I said that I would do something in our, there's a monthly magazine called The Cartoonist. <laughs> like the ice cream industry has its magazine, and we have a magazine too. So I whet their appetite, and I hope to push this use of work forward so that well, let me ask a, a follow-up. Do you think that it would be 
more effective and more likely to work if it were part of a more general set of standards which dealt with other things as well. Like, for example, uh, there's a cartoonist in the New York Post. Whenever he draws a picture of Al Sharpton, or not whenever, but several times, he would draw little circles coming out of his bottom as if he were making gas. And that he gets away with, with doing that sort of thing. There's all sorts of outrageous things there like that. There are all sorts of outrageous now, things which are not the same as recognizing that there is a viral infection in our profession. But it, it doesn't sound like it'll There's work. There's bad stuff. So say, oh, this is a bad cartoon. This is uh, improper. This is ugly. A cartoon might be pornographic. A cartoon might be racist. There's all kinds of reasons to say a cartoon is a bad cartoon. I'm not interested in discerning between bad or unfortunate cartoons. I'm interested in a specific viral <coughs> infection which is destroying my profession. Okay. Yes? Uh, We're going to have to wrap it You're up. You're about as hopeful as an oncologist, Jaco. Do you have a note of optimism to end with? <laughs> you want me to say something good? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the optimism, the optimism is that the head of my syndicate said this would be a help to him and that if he had a complete list of the codes, he would see to it that none of these codes would get through. And I think that's an amazing wow. Can I ask you a question? Sure. In 1942, there was a professor of sociology at Yale named Raymond Kennedy. And in 1942, he wrote a book about how Jews were internationalists, they were sneaky, all the sort of standard um, stereotypes that existed in the 1940s at Yale. And this, in 1942, when three million Jews were dead and millions more were to die. And that was acceptable in the language and in the discourse of the time. Today, if we would speak in those terms about Jews or anybody else on this campus, it would be perceived as, you know, beyond the bounds and gauche and not acceptable. And I, I think scholars and people would get in trouble for her saying these horrible things about any group. And yet, recently at Yale University, uh, Norman Finkelstein came to give a lecture, and it was actually an officially, uh, part of an official program of, a, of a, a Yale program here on campus. It was a, the academic uh, support of the, the event. Uh, and recently, a scholar, a respected scholar at Yale, took her class to meet uh, President Ahmadinejad and they had a, a session of engagement. Today, I, I would argue like 1942, I don't think people in the academy are thinking clearly. I think we are infected by the virus to some extent. The fact that somebody spreading the protocols of the elders of Zion, like the Iranian revolutionary regime, and I think Finkelstein to an extent as well, and speaking in language not about the, the Jews of the United States or the Jews in, uh, at, on the Ivy League campuses, but certain types of Jews, like Israelis and others. And there isn't a reaction. There was not outrage. In fact, there was an outrage at our recent conference that we had here, that we were, we had this large conference of 100, more than 100 papers presented by leading scholars, and Yisa in the conference was actually portrayed by some people as being um, Islamophobic and anti-Muslim and racist and, and the rest, and it was it was this, the attack was sort of by I would say extreme type of bloggers and politicians, but it had traction among some scholars. Can you explain how, with your very important research, how can you break this code? How can you get people to see the anti-Semitism of, of now? which is, and I'm using my words and my language very carefully, is genocidal. How do you break through the contemporary? I think the way you break through that is, and something I intend to do, is to make, I intend to make contact, this is why you screwed up my life. <laughs> I, I intend to make contact with gay and lesbian groups to show them this presentation and to explain 
how gays and lesbians throughout the Muslim world are being attacked yes. and that they are not reacting because of this infection. I want to go to Christian groups. I want to go to women's groups. I want to go to the various groups that are being targeted. Don't want to go to the Jews. Don't want to talk about the Jews. Want to talk about people who have been mesmerized by this infection into not defending their own position. It's just shocking to go in and to say to a woman's group, do you know about female genital mutilation? Why are you not talking about it? I'll tell you why. And then show them this presentation and say either, either you can cure yourself or not. I would hope that this work at YISA would be a kind of vaccine. I would hope that if I would sit down with a representative of gay and lesbians and show them this and then say, do you ever wonder why you people are not responding? You've got to recognize when you are infected. You've got to recognize anti-Semitism as a symptom. You know how mushrooms work? I, I, you know, after rain, mushrooms pop up. And people say, oh, wow, there's mushrooms. Well, under the ground, there is some giant amorphous creature some huge slug under the ground that you don't know about. And when it rains, the slug puts out these flowers, puts out these sexual organs, the, the mushrooms, which will then spread spores. So when you see in your garden mushrooms all around like this, instead of saying, oh, here are the mushrooms, you have to understand that below the mushrooms, under the ground, is this massive, monstrous, jelly monster thing. <laughs> and the anti-Semitism, we shouldn't be talking about the anti-Semitism and fighting the anti-Semitism. We should be letting all of the groups that are being attacked understand that they have been paralyzed by watching the Jews and the anti-Jews. That's what I think we have to do. Yes? Your ideas are very consistent with those of the anti-defamation league, um, for which I used to work. Have you been in contact with anybody there with this working paper or your ideas from this paper? I am totally aligned with one organization, and that's yourself. And wherever this goes, and Yusuf, Yusuf is videotaping this, this will be online. Hopefully enough people will go and will see it, and that it will spread, and other organizations will pick it up and carry the torch. But frankly, I am not interested in the ADL. I'm interested in the Christian churches, I'm interested in the women's groups, I'm interested in the gay and lesbian groups, I'm interested in media people, I'm interested in journalists, I'm interested in professors, I'm interested in people who are for academic freedom. These people who are being targeted, the target is not the Jews. The reason I asked about the ADL is that their education wing, A World of Difference, does anti-bias education and looks at all of the groups that you mentioned, not just ADL, groups. ADL is a Jewish group. It is. But yes, and therefore I am not in, you asked me a question. I, I, I answer the question. I'm not interested in them. I'm not interested in them. I'm interested in society protecting itself. Absolutely. I don't, it's like, we're like, a worm tied to a hook, and along comes a fish and says, oh, I'm going to eat you. And what do we say? We say, it's bad to eat worms. And the fish says, I love to eat worms. They don't, don't eat worms. I always eat worms. Oh, please, it's bad. You'll be having What we have to say is, there's a hook here. I'm here only because someone is trying to kill you. Right? If you eat me, you die. Jews and anti-Semitism is a strategy 
for infecting society so that it cannot protect itself. And what we have to do is we have to alert society to this threat, which somehow they have been frozen into not responding to. That's the way I see it. The answer is not the Jews. The answer is society that's about to be destroyed has to protect itself. Yes? I suggest that what you said that you're going to write a paper for the cartoonist uh, uh, publication. In a way, you are creating your own virus to counteract the viral infection that already No, exists. it's called it's a like, vaccine. It's not yeah. called a virus. Well, when when you protect people against a viral spread, you are vaccinating them. I am not creating something to make people have some sort of viral response to Islamism. It has nothing to do with Muslims. It has nothing to do with Nazis. It has to do with the nature of mass movements and the use of anti-Semitism as a strategy. And as I said before, when the Islamic threat passes, and hopefully it will, and we're living 50 years from now, you young guys, not me, but 50 years from now, when there's some UFO cult attempting to take over the world, and they drag out all the anti-Semitic codes, society should be protected enough to say, uh-oh, the anti-Semitism is back. That means that under the ground, there's this big slug coming to get us. No, I meant to me. I meant it in a positive way. Because no, I know you did. But I'm not interested in starting some counter-viral thing. I'm interested in society being vaccinated so that when it sees the red spots, it will recognize the presence of an attack. It's education. It's not. Are we finished? Yeah. Well, one there, one there. Hold on. Just, just one Strange comment. Strange looking fellow in the back. Okay. Just one comment. It wasn't too long ago. The cartoon in the Dutch newspaper caused uh, threats and death threats and riots in European cities. Danish. 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 That's right. The Danish. And yet, where's the outrage from our side of the of the aisle, so to speak? Was it accepted? <laughs> Yet we admit we're accepting these uh, terrible uh, cartoons from uh, in the states. Or that a Why Yale, are we not We're not published by Yale. Yeah. Is yeah. afraid to put the cartoons in it. That's right. This is the effect of the of this virus. Yes. Yeah. Maybe this will be the last of us. We when when you go going. to fight this, how do you know you've actually gotten the slug and you're not just picking another mushroom? <laughs> How do you know when you really got to it, when you got to the living, breathing, hateful body of it? What you do once you recognize the hateful body of it, if you are a gay, lesbian, transgender, and what the hell is the name of another one? Indes indeterminate people. If you're one of those, then you have to say, wow. We have been frozen into inaction right. because of these codes. I want women's groups to say, wow, we are not protecting women around the world. And here we now know the reason. If somebody's walking around coughing all the time, you say, go to a doctor and find out what's wrong. We now know what's wrong. <coughs> As you said, there are lots of isms and anti-isms, but we said anti-Semitism is unique. My question is, why is it unique? What is the tipping point that makes anti-Semitism unique, but anti-lesbianism and other anti-Muslimism not unique? I didn't say anti-Semitism was unique. I thought you did. No. I said that the anti-Semitic incitement codes are unique, that there are 32 specific graphic codes divided into three families that are used to mesmerize people and that for some reason it is unique. I never thought it would be unique. I thought that after I did this I would go on and find collaterally about Chinese, about blacks, about this, about that. Not there. For some reason it is unique. 
maybe my next paper will deal with why it's unique. I don't know why it's unique, but it is unique. How it started, where it's going, <coughs> what, what, how does it met, metamorphosize and change the, the mass movement that uses it? These are all interesting academic questions. But the you first you thing I think that is the finding that blew me away was the existence of these specific codes. You would think that in 500, 550 cartoons, I'd find more than 32 allegations, wouldn't you think? I mean, they could be able to think of other stuff. I'm creative enough to think of new attacks, right? But we have these three families of strings. I think we have a lot of work to do. But the first thing is to recognize anti-Semitic cartoons as symptoms of the presence of a viral attack on Western civilization. When we understand that, then we've got what when the head of a, a major distributor of cartoons looks at it and says, wow, I got to share with you that uh, last week I sat with one of the editors of the Wall Street Journal and I showed him this presentation. And he totally flipped out. He said, I've never seen anything like this. You've discovered something new. And he's proposing that the Wall Street Journal do a piece on this presentation on Yissa and all like that. And he explained that up until the election, they're not doing features that are connected to the elections. Then he's going to take a two-week vacation and go see his mother and go see his ex-wife or whatever. Yes. And maybe promise that just around Thanksgiving, I should send him the PowerPoint. And I said to him, no, I won't send you the PowerPoint. I'm going to send you a link to the Yissa presentation. And he says, we want to do something about this. And I think that if the Wall Street Journal writes about this, and if I get syndicates that are distributing cartoons, you want the good news. I think that's the good news. I think that there are people who will look at this and say, you know what, we are affected. Last question. I have a question. You said that there are some people who are just carrying it and spreading it unknowingly, but there are others that are consciously spreading the virus. Right. Would you feel comfortable saying who you think um, might be consciously trying to spread the virus? I don't think, I don't think it matters. It's like, it's like uh, global heating, global warming, you know? I don't understand it. I mean, maybe because I've lived outside of America too long. Everybody's arguing about whether we humans caused it or we humans didn't cause it. That makes no sense. It's like a like some silly Jewish attitude to find out who's guilty. Who cares who's guilty? If there are things we can do to make it better, we should do the things to make it better. Why is there argument over whether we did it or we didn't do it? Either we can fix it or we can't fix it. That should be the only question. I don't care whether a cartoonist is an anti-Semite or he's simply infected. I want to see to it that the means of contagion are cut, and that the people who see these cartoons will have been educated enough to say, whoa, they're trying to get me. If they're yelling about Jews killing babies in Gaza, it's because they want gen female genital mutilation, they want an end to academic freedom, they want to ban gays, they want we got to look at the infection, whether it's being spread by someone who's simply coughing because he's sick, 
Well, because he's somebody who's putting drops in everybody's water to, to get them sick. So on that note, just a, a brief point. Yeah, okay, thank you. Next week, we have Holgar here, who's a postdoc who's just arrived recently from Munich. He's going to be speaking on blurring the boundaries, what's new in the new anti-Semitism. He's done a very uh, good work on globalization and anti-Semitism in the German context, so he'll be speaking. And Jakob, on behalf of everybody, really thank you. The paper is wonderful, and thank you for your good work.